My name is Ashley. I serve in Cross Kids. I'm going to be reading from Exodus 20, 1 through 7, the Ten Commandments. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. This is the word of the Lord. All right, welcome to Cross Community Church. Uh, my name is Brandon. For those that don't know me, I'm one of the pastors here. And if you've never seen me before, it's usually because I'm hanging out in the sound booth or up in the production room. But um, I serve as the head over our worship and our production ministry. And really, at, at Cross Community Church, we're not a giant church, and so a lot of the staff have to, to wear a lot of different hats. So I took over Regeneration this year, uh, because why not? So uh, we're gonna, I'm going to talk more about regeneration at the end of the service, but I'm really glad to be here this morning. I'm really, really glad to have the opportunity to, to preach and to communicate. And so uh, right now we're in the Ten Commandments series. We're, we're simply walking through each of the commandments that God gave to, to Israel through Moses. And, uh, and it's, it's really, it's the, it's the culmination of the law. It's the most important things. It's the, the things that were etched in stone. And um, if, I'm, if I'm really honest, this morning, probably for the past 10 to 12 years or so, I've kind of had a complicated relationship um, with the Ten Commandments. And uh, not really with the commandments themselves, but with the way uh, that some Christians have chosen to use the commandments um, and to sometimes weaponize the commandments um, against our culture. So I don't know, uh, Jason talked about this two weeks ago, I don't know if you were here in LaFleur County uh, 10 to 12 years ago, but there was like a, a movement or... I'm not, I'm not sure even how it started, but there was, there was a movement to display the Ten Commandments in your yard, on your church building, on, uh, on billboards, and it was really important to some people. And I remember I was working at Red Oak at the time at a, at a small church there, and um, a guy came by just asking us if we, if we wanted to, to put them on the side of our building. And it was free, and it was like a, a thing that was, a lot of people were doing, and I just couldn't understand, you know, why, why was it so important that people were, were displaying the Ten Commandments? Why was it so important that we needed them on billboards? And uh, I believed in God's Word. I, I didn't have an issue with the commandments. I didn't have an issue with, with what He said. Um, but I began to, to realize that there were, were some people, and then to be honest, I, I, I cannot speak for the intentions of, of every person um, that put them in the yard, that put them on their building, that, that paid for them to be on billboards. But I do know that there seemed to be this idea out there that if we could just get our culture to understand God's law, and if our culture, if America, or if LaFleur County, if Oklahoma, if they would submit themselves to his law, then that would be for their best. And while that may be true, and I do agree um, that God's law is best, and to live under his rule and his reign and his law is best, while that may be true, we have to be careful as Christians not to put so much emphasis on the law that we tell our culture what, what we want from you is to live up to some sort of moral code. What we call that in Christianity and what Jesus railed against as he was here on earth, we call that legalism. Elevating the law above the work and the, and the, and the power of Christ and the gospel. As believers, we have to be sure that what we use is the law to point towards Christ and to, uh, to share the gospel because the gospel is our, our front and center uh, focus. And so Paul actually writes about the law. He says it's the ministry of death carved in letters on stone. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7, he says it again. It's the ministry of death carved in letters on stone. So to share the law only without Christ is to share death without the hope. However, the Ten Commandments are important. 
And we, here's what we have said thus far about the Ten Commandments and why, why that we need to be studying them as believers. Is, is, uh, first of all, uh, they're the words of God. God literally and verbally spoke words to Moses. It was so loud and it was the sound of thunder that all the people of Israel could even hear what God was saying to Moses. Second of all, uh, they, they reveal to us who God is. The Ten Commandments reveal to us the nature and the character of God. The one that we're going to read today is, is going to be one that even further develops the idea of who God is. They reveal to us the nature and the character of God. The third is that they keep us free. <clears throat> so for believers, it is absolutely important that we understand his law, that we understand these Ten Commandments, and we understand how God wants us to live. They keep us free because we, we don't have to be enslaved to sin. We can walk in freedom. And I'm going to add one this morning. Uh, the Ten Commandments are important because they lead us to Christ. And I hope that you see that this morning. The Ten Commandments as a whole, they are a stepping stone that lead us to Christ and his work on the cross. And so uh, this morning, we're, we're going to look at that third commandment. Uh, so if you want to open up your, your Bible or open up the Bible app on your phone, whichever you choose, I'm going to be in Exodus chapter 20, reading from the ESV. Verse 7, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. God says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Let's read that one more time. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. That's the message. That's the application. We're done. Let's pray. You know, it's real simple. Um, but I think there's more to it. This is one of those uh, commandments that I've, I've heard a lot as a kid. I grew up in the church, and uh, I definitely remember Sunday school messages, uh, just preaching through the Ten Commandments. And it's one of those things I always kind of understood, and I thought that it just meant like, we don't cuss. We don't use his name um, in cussing. But what I've come to find out is that what it means to take the Lord's name in vain is much bigger than that. It reveals something about his character, about who he is, and about how he wants us to view him um, that I find that is really interesting. So just to kind of paint the correct picture, uh, I wanted to kind of build around the context. I love context. Uh, I love reading around Scripture. I love the story of the Old Testament and what's going on. So just to, just to as briefly as I can, just kind of summarize what's going on. At this point in Israel's history, uh, they're, they're, uh, they have been in captivity in Egypt for around 400 years. And uh, God sent them a, a servant named Moses who, who was called to deliver the people out of slavery from Egypt and lead them into the promised land. And so God sends Moses. Uh, he, he, uh, he has this incredible, miraculous event where, uh, where God says to Moses at a burning bush, you're going to lead my people out. Moses questions it a lot. Uh, God says, you're going to do this. I'm going to empower you, and we're, I'm going to cast judgment at the same time against Egypt and their idolatry. And so Moses goes back to the people. Um, he convinces them uh, that they're going to be led out of, of slavery into freedom. Um, God sends the ten plagues against Egypt, um, announcing his judgment against them, against their gods, and ultimately against their god of Pharaoh, who they believed was also a deity, and said, no, there is no Lord but me. There is no God but me. And uh, miraculously, these, these ten plagues happen. The people of Israel are, are uh, actually encouraged to leave because they're tired of these plagues. And on the way out, the Egyptian army and, and Pharaoh has a change of heart again and decides to pursue them. And so um, just to kind of imagine for, for just put yourself in the shoes of the Israelites for just a minute, um, you've, you've only known captivity. You've only known hard work um, for the Egyptians. And now you're being told you're going to have freedom and there's going to be a land that's, that's being prepared for you by God, a land that's flowing with milk and honey. But you have to go through some hard things to get there. You're not, a, you're not an army. You're not a, a people skilled at war, but yet here's the Egyptian army behind you pursuing you, um, trying to lead you back into captivity. And so um, one of the greatest miracles happens. God splits the Red Sea, 
And the Bible says that people literally walked through on dry land and literally walls of water were on their side as the people of Israel, probably around like 2 million people or so is what some of the scholars think, are led through the, the water. The Egyptians pursue them into the uh, like into whatever that little divide or whatever that God made. Um, as soon as the Israelites get through, the Egyptians are still behind, and God causes the water to collapse and absolutely decimates the Egyptian army. And just imagine, like, this is kind of a crazy story. And it's, it's a thing that, that maybe if you're here this morning, you're like, I don't know if that really happened. Um, scripture s- says it, it did happen. And uh, just imagine what it's like to be an Israelite at this time and to think, who is this God? Who is this God that can part the waters, that can destroy the Egyptian army that is more powerful than anything that we've ever seen? Then they're led on through the wilderness for a time, led by God in what the scripture says is the pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. Um, The supernatural things that Israel got to see had to be incredible. They had to have an understanding and an awe of who God was, of who, his, who he could be, the power that he had, um, until finally they're led up to, to this moment in Scripture. So Exodus 19, 20, uh, a few more things happen, but eventually the nation of Israel, again, around like, it's not like a few thousand, they're thinking, you know, somewhere around two million people end up encamped around this mountain called Mount Sinai. And so God calls up Moses, their leader, and he gives them specific instructions. He says, I want you to go back down there and consecrate the people. Basically, he wanted them to be ceremonially clean. It didn't really make them clean, but the idea was that God was going to meet with the people, and he wanted the people to be clean in order to meet with him because God is holy, because God is pure, and he is, and he is righteous. And it's really hard for the unrighteous to be in the presence of God. And so he asks Moses to, to ceremonially cleanse the people. And so they do that. And then he says, Moses, I want you to, this is all important, by the way. I'm not just telling a big old story. Uh, he says, Moses, I want you to build a border around the bottom of Mount Sinai. And you tell the people, if you step foot beyond that border, then it's death for you. Have them killed. He warns Moses several times. Um, so the Lord descends upon the top of Mount Sinai in the fire again. And the scripture says that the the, the people couldn't see God. There was billowing smoke. And I kind of, I guess the the best mental picture I can think of is kind of like an erupting volcano. Like you see the billowing smoke rising up into the the sky. Um, You can see the kind of the fire and you can hear the voice of God. And, And scripture says it was as thunder. God again warns Moses. He says, be careful that no one from Israel, because I'm sure like, wow, this is like an incredible, crazy thing I've, I've never seen before. Um, I'm sure people were curious and wanted to see, and as they could hear God, what he looked like. He said, be careful that no one breaks through the barrier and, and comes through the smoke and gazes upon the Lord. Um, for, for them, it will be instant death, and I might break out against the people of Israel. God was very specific. He had very high standards, and he was about to reveal his law and his standards to the people of Israel. And so just imagine for a minute the awe that you would have at who this God is, the things that you've seen, the way that he has, the way that he has saved them, the way that he has led them from captivity, uh, the miracles they've seen. And Scripture says that God wanted them to know who he was. As God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, uh, Scripture says he, he came down with the tablets and his face shone. It was literally like his, his face was glowing because he had been in the presence and in the glory of the Lord. And when you see how bright the Lord is, it couldn't help but absorb some of that glory. And I guess people could see it. Incredible experience. Wish I, wish I could have been there. So it's here that God delivers the Ten Commandments. He starts with the first, and this is where we, where we kind of started with this. He says that, uh, that, that I am the Lord your God, and you shall have no other gods before me. In fact, the first three commandments are all commandments that focus on mankind's relationship with God. So Jason started there week one. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me because there is no other God. I am more powerful than anything you've ever experienced. Um, I I put Egypt, the most powerful nation in the world, to shame. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other God before me. Second, 
Second commandment. That uh, you shall make no idols for yourself. Kind of in the same vein, but God's saying, listen, don't make any idols. By the way, if you've read the... the uh, the Israelites didn't really do good with that one. In fact, right after Moses, actually as Moses came down with the law, they had already built an idol. So uh, it, I don't, it's kind of hard to understand how they'd seen all that God done, and yet here they are building an idol. But God says, you shall build no idols, make no image in the likeness of, of man or beast or nature or anything. I am the Lord your God. You follow me only. And then the third one, you shall not take my name in vain. He will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So what does it mean um, to not take the Lord's name in vain? Here's what I kind of learned this week. And as I, I read about his name, I, I really um, I felt like I, I, I grew an understanding of, of who God is and, and how he wants us to, to interact with him and, and the respect and the reverence that we're supposed to have with him. So first of all, um, what's it mean to not take the Lord's name in vain? Simply, it means to not misuse his name. In fact, some of your translations, if you read different than the ESV, you might have said something like that. Do not misuse the name of the Lord. So that would include things like cussing, flippantly talking about God in our speech. Uh, when we get angry, using his name and invoking his name to, to display our, our anger or our rage, to misuse his name. How dare we as believers, as people, um, misuse the God, the name of the God of the Lord Most High. Do you not see who he is? Do you not see the power and the authority that he has? Do not misuse his name. The second thing it means is to attribute his name to something that is false. To attribute his name to something that is false. That is another way uh, that we take the Lord's name in vain. Simply what that means is to, to maybe promise or to swear by the Lord in his name. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up and you never, ever did that. That was like, you, you, never, you never swear by God. You never make an oath by God. Now, in the Old Testament, they did. They did it plenty of times, but it was, it was a, a serious thing to take the Lord's name and to, to make an oath by it. An even more serious thing to, to make an oath to the Lord and to be lying at the same time. To never really mean what you said. It's not something that we take lightly. But most importantly, the third thing it means to take the Lord's name in vain is to undermine his holiness and righteousness. To undermine his holiness and righteousness. To, so to use his name flippantly or to talk about God in a demeaning manner. Or to just refer to him like, like some of the deists did of old. He's like just the man upstairs, the God, the God that's far off, um, the God that doesn't really um, have anything to do with us. He's just the old man upstairs. That is not who God is. So what does this commandment reveal about the nature and character of God? Simply that God wants us to have a reverence to him. That God wants us to have a reverence before him and to him. Like the same God that lives today, the same God that sent Christ, the same God that we gather here together to worship today is the same one that led the people through the Red Sea, is the same one that came down in fire and, and, uh, and gave the, the commandments, is the same one that has raised Christ from the dead. And although those things happened thousands of years ago and we've never seen them um, we know that God is someone who is not to be trifled with, and he is someone to be revered. And so I would say be very careful about how you speak about God. When I hear people use his name in an unsavory way, it makes me nervous. Like, oh, you don't know what you're saying. You don't know the God that you're speaking about. Another thing that it reveals about the nature and character of God is that God has many names and that they are all important. I had a huge rabbit hole uh, last week and, and this week as I was kind of kind of trying to understand this because it's 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 not the same in our culture. Um, how we name people and what we do with names it, it it just doesn't carry the same weight. So let me give you kind of an example. I don't know if you 
you have some of those memories that are on the periphery of, of your memory from, like, I don't know how young I was. I was probably three, maybe four. One of my earliest memories was a dog that we had. His name was Bear. And I remember being terrified of this dog. Now, um, to be fair, I, I was a kid, and he was just big. My parents said he was a very loving dog. He, he liked to jump on you, though, and he, he wanted his, his loving. And so uh, to three-year-old me, he was big, he was hairy, he was terrifying, and he was appropriately named Bear, because in my mind, he, he was basically as big as a bear. And uh, that, that's really an example of where a name given to that animal was really a description of what it was. It was kind of, in my mind, tied to its being. But that's not typically how we name people. So my name is Brandon. It doesn't have uh, any meaning that was uh, meant or in, like inferred to me by my parents. It was just a name that was popular at the time. It sounded good um, to my parents, and so they named me Brandon. It's not a family name. has no significance. Uh, my middle name is Michael. Um, that's my dad's first name. And so in our culture, m- most of the time, our names have no meaning. They're just things that sound good. They don't, they don't have anything to do with our being. They don't say anything about us. Sometimes we have names that come from family. So we, we bear a grandmother or grandfather's or, or father's or mother's name. Um, and rarely do we have names that are supposed to infer some sort of meaning. So some people um, have named their kids things, and they thought, this, this is what this means. This, is, this means grace, or this means son of God, or this means whatever, you know. But, but God was different. God had names that he revealed to the people of Israel, and they were intricately tied to his being. So, for example, um, and, and the people understood this, and they did the same thing. So let me just tell you, for example, Moses, who we've been talking about. Um, Moses was named by Pharaoh's daughter, and she named him with a common Egyptian name that was also a, a pun from, it was an Egyptian name, it was also a pun in Hebrew, and his name simply meant one who draws out of the water. And so if you remember the story, uh, the way this kind of happens is Moses is, is placed in the Nile, and the Egyptian, uh, one of Pharaoh's daughters, finds the baby in the basket, and she draws him out of the water. And so his name meant he was drawn out of the water. It was intricately tied to, to something about Moses. It wasn't just a random name that she came up with. Um, one more. When Jesus called his disciples to follow him, he renamed some of them. For example, a man named Cephas or Cephas became one of his disciples. Does that sound familiar to you? Probably not, because Jesus renamed him Peter, which means the rock. On Upon Peter's profession that, that Jesus was the Messiah, he said, you're no longer Cephas. You are Peter. You are the rock. God's names are similar in that fashion. Um, from the very beginning, and this is one of the things we talked about uh, that, that Jason mentioned two weeks ago, um, one of God's name is Elohim. It's really most closely related to our word for God, but it means the supreme one. It's that idea that he is supreme, that he is God. His name is Elohim, but he's got many names. Later on, um, he reveals that his name is Yahweh. In fact, in Exodus chapter 6, God says to Moses, uh, I am Yahweh. Yahweh is, is a Hebrew word that uh, it's kind of, it's etymology, it's root is in the idea of to be. So, you know, like, you know, you've heard to be or not to be, you know, the whole Hamlet thing, I think. Uh, but it's this idea that God ex- simply exists, that he never had a beginning, that he will never have an end. He has always been, he always will be. It's his eternal personal name. That is Yahweh. It's his name that also means he is here, that he exists, but he is with us. God is Yahweh, and you, you see in your scripture, in your ESV or whatever you're reading, a lot of times we just use God or use Lord um, equally interchangeable, but the Hebrew is different. They have meanings. God says to Moses also in that Exodus chapter 6 that he appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, which means God Almighty, that he appeared to them as El Shaddai, another one of his names. Um, God came down to earth, and um, he sent his son, Jesus. 
we say Jesus, but in Hebrew, his name was Yeshua. And Yeshua means salvation. Makes perfect sense, right? Jesus came for the purpose of salvation. God has many more names than I've just mentioned, but we need to understand that the names that we have for God are intricately tied to his being. We don't take those in vain. We do not take him and his, uh, and, and his being in vain. We understand that he is God Almighty, that he is the all-powerful God that has existed forever and always will be. And as believers, that's the attitude that we have before him. And so I have an education degree, and one of the things we learned was to, uh, like when we were setting up rules for our classroom, to, to frame them in more positive ways. I mean, hey, it might have changed by now, um, but the Ten Commandments are a lot of do-nots. And so simply this morning, I kind of wanted to frame it in just a, a different way. So what God wants us to do, simply our application this morning, is to revere him and honor his name. God wants us to revere him and honor his name. And also, he wants us to understand how the law fits into our Christian worldview. So we take this like small snippet of scripture and we, we walk through it today. But, uh, but the law has implications for us today. And this is, this is what's important for us to understand. I want to go back to that 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. Where, where Paul said, he says, Now if the ministry of death, carved in letters on stone, came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because it's glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there is glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. So Paul's really simply saying the law brought glory. It was an awesome thing to happen. But it also brought death. What's he mean by that? We understand as believers that in, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? He created Adam and Eve. It was all perfect. But Adam and Eve chose sin, and it fundamentally broke our world. And so just the, the huge overview of Scripture here in a nutshell is that we have the fall of man, the brokenness. Um, we have God choosing a nation for himself because God is justice, and he, he could have easily done away with mankind because of our transgression. But God is also love, and he is also grace and mercy. And so he chose to choose a people for himself for the purpose of sending his son but in order to know that we could never attain to his standard of righteousness, God gave us his standard of righteousness. That's the Ten Commandments. That's the law that God gave to Moses. It was God's standard. And you know what happened? No one could live up to it. It brought death because no one could live up to it. Until God sent his son, Jesus, Yeshua, salvation, um, the only person, the only man born of Adam that could ever live up to the law. He sent his son um, to die on the cross for the sin of humanity, to redeem humanity. We had to have the law so we knew that no one could live up to the law. So someone could come up and live up to the law, Jesus, and that he could die um, for us, a, a perfect man that didn't deserve the death, took on the sin of humanity. Um, he died on the cross but even greater yet, he was resurrected three days later, overcoming death and sin. And Scripture clearly and simply tells us that what we need to understand this morning is that all we have to do is place our faith in Christ. Understand our sin. When we read the law and we work through it and we learn from it, we understand that we could never live up to it and we revere God for it and we thank God for Jesus because he did it on our behalf. And so this morning, if you're a believer what I simply ask you to do is to be careful how you use the law. The law is good. The law is perfect. It's God's standard, but no one can live up to it. We can use the law to point to sin, but we ultimately point people to Christ, he who ever overcome sin on our behalf, he who could live up to the law, and he who brought salvation to us. If you're in here this morning, you've never placed your faith in Christ, I invite you this morning um, to, to believe in Jesus, to place your faith in him. Understand, 
you're not perfect. None of us in here are. Uh, just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you can all of a sudden um, obtain to the law. Uh, we need the Holy Spirit and his empowerment to, to enable us to do that. But we're all broken, sinful people. And understand that Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And he, he came to save you. He came to redeem you. And this morning I invite you this, to the front to, to pray. To catch me after the service, to catch someone who's on staff here after the service, or, or go to the welcome desk if you don't know where to go, and you want to talk to someone about what it means to have a relationship with Christ and then place your faith in Him, we'd love for you to know Jesus this morning. Would you guys pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to, to be here, to, to preach, to make much of you and your name to call us as believers and as a church to, to revere you, to respect you as the Lord our God. God, I, I pray that we are, are careful how we speak about you in our speech. Father, I pray that, that we would do a, a good job of, of being good stewards for the gospel, that we use the law to point to sin, to point to Christ, to point to our salvation. Father, I pray these things in your holy name. Amen.